Hello everyone, welcome back. So, uh, so far we've approached our limits uh, graphically and numerically, no pun intended. Um, we're going to work towards the next section, uh, approaching our limits algebraically, um, because there's some downsides to graphical and numerical approaches. And in this video, in this example, I want to show uh, what can potentially go wrong when we try to approach a limit uh, numerically. So far, our numerical approach to these limits has involved creating a table of values where we want to have our x value approach uh, a or whatever our limit value is, and we usually pick a sequence of x values that gets closer and closer to the uh, limit value of interest. And then we see, well, what kind of pattern does our function have in its outputs as we plug those sequence of x values in. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to see in this example uh, things are going to go wrong. So in this example, we want to guess the value of the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of the function sine of pi over x. So to do this using the approach we've been using so far, we need to select a sequence of x values that is getting closer and closer to 0 while always being on the right hand side of 0. Plug those x values into our function sine of pi over x and see what the output is doing. So let's go ahead and start creating our table of values. So I want to do this example a couple times around with a couple different sequence of x values that are always approaching 0 from the right. But we're going to see our function behaves differently for each sequence. The first sequence I'm going to do is going to start at uh, 1, then go to 1 half, and then 1 tenth, 1 one hundredth, 1 one thousandth, and so on. This is a pretty common uh, pattern we use, especially when we're trying to approach uh, x equals 0. All right, so I have my first sequence of x values set up and ready to uh, plug into our function. And so in some of our previous examples, we could actually uh, have found the limit just by plugging our limit value of interest into our function. Here our limit value is 0, but if we tried to plug 0 into our, uh, our sine of pi over x function, we would see that it is undefined. So that shortcut will not work for us here. We're going to talk in later sections uh, exactly when we can apply a shortcut like that. Um, here we cannot. So we have to plug in uh, all of these x values now and see what happens to the output of our function. Starting with the first one. Well, if we plug uh, x in, we get sine of pi, which is 0. If we plug x equals 1 half in, or 0 0.5, we end up getting sine of 2 pi, which is also 0. If we plug 1 tenth in for our x value inside of our function, that'll turn into sine of 10 pi. But sine of 10 pi is also 0. So, so far, it looks like we have uh, the output of our function as 0 each and every time. If we do this for our next couple entries in our table, uh, we're going to get the exact same thing. If we plug 100th into our function, we get sine of 100 pi, which is also 0. If we plug 1,000th into our function, yep, you're right, we're going to get 0 again. So based off this sequence of x values, which is certainly approaching 0 from the right, it looks like our function is always having the output of 0. So maybe the limit of this function as x approaches 0 is actually 0. All right, like I mentioned earlier in the video, I wanted to approach 0 in a couple different ways. Um, so here we approached a 0 from 1, 1 half, 1 tenth, 1 hundredth, 1 thousandth, and so on. This next sequence of values is going to be a little bit weirder, um, but it's still going to be getting closer and closer to 0. So let me go ahead and set that up for us. I have our next sequence of x values uh, up on the board over here. And so this time we're approaching a 0 still from the right. Uh, we're going to go through the sequence of x values starting at 2 fifths, then 2 ninths, 2 thirteenths, 2 four hundred and fifths, and then 2 four thousand and fifths. And if we look at the kind of decimal representations of these fractions, we're going from 0 0.4, 0 0.2 repeating, about 0 0.15381, 0 0.00494, 0 0.00499. Looking at the decimals over here is just to reassure us that we are actually getting closer and closer to zero. So let's see. If we start with our first x value of 2 fifths, uh, or 0 0.4, if we plug that into our function sine of pi over x, it ends up simplifying to give us a sine of 5 pi over 2, just really the reciprocal of that fraction times pi. Well, what is sine of 5 pi over 2? You might have to think back to the unit circle or use our calculators to help us there. Make sure your calculator is in radian mode if you're doing that. Uh, but it ends up giving us the uh, value of 1. Okay, so we're still pretty far away from 0. 
uh, we're at 0 0.4. Um, in our previous approach, we saw or we thought that our limit was going to be equal to zero. Right now, it looks like we're at one. Maybe as we go through this table, uh, we'll get closer to zero, or maybe something else is going to happen. Let's go ahead and find out. Next, let's plug in two ninths inside of our function. After we plug that in, it'll simplify to sine of nine pi over two, which is also equal to one. If we do this for our remaining entries in our uh, table, sine of at pi over 2 thirteenths simplifies to sine of 13 pi over 2, which is also 1. You can probably guess what happens for the next two entries. If we plug in 2 over 405 or 2 over 4005, we get 1 as our output each and every time. So based off our second table uh, and what we've been doing before, it looks like, well, we could say that our limit approaches 1. Well, the truth is, this limit actually does not exist. It doesn't approach 0 or 1 or any number. It actually oscillates infinitely many times between the values of negative 1 and positive 1, which is the range of our sine function. Uh, if we take a moment to look at the graph of this function, which we wouldn't want to produce by hand, we'll have to use a computer to help us, we'll kind of see what goes on. So I'm going to go ahead and put the graph somewhere up here. And so now as we look at that graph, we can see it as we get closer and closer to the origin. It doesn't matter which side, but we're approaching from the right-hand side. Uh, we can see that oscillation. It's happening more and more frequently. Our function is just bouncing back and forth between these values between negative 1 and 1. It's never approaching a single value, and that's why this limit does not exist. So the point of this video, uh, showing what can go wrong with the numerical approach of finding your limits, we can't always get away with just plugging in some number really, really close to zero. Um, so we need uh, another way, a more surefire way of finding our limits, and that's going to come with our algebraic approach in the next couple of sections.